Hello, my name is Chris Lemaire, and I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Q&A with filmmaker Emerald Fennell and star Carrie Mulligan, who of course are joining us to discuss their amazing new film, Promising Young Woman. Uh, our conversation today is moderated by Amy Nicholson, who is a film writer for the New York Times and also the host of the great podcast, Unspooled. So we are very thrilled she can join us and we hope you uh, enjoy the following conversation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Amy Nicholson and uh, join me in sort of Zoom waving at Carrie and Emerald. Hi, it's lovely to have you guys here to talk about Promising Young Woman. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I mean, I'll just jump in. Um, First, just as a little bit of backstory uh, for people who don't know, you know, Emerald, this is your first film. You also come from the acting world. I think some people out there probably recognize you as Camilla Parker Bowles uh, in The Crown. But I was wondering, like, have the two of you met before this? So we kind of crossed paths a couple of times very briefly. Um, but, but no, we didn't know each other at all until, I mean, um, we sent her amazing agent, Tor Belfridge, the script. And now I won't leave Carrie dead. <laughs> like stalking wise with everything you write from here on out? Yeah, yeah. Just, just in life, just forever. My phone is <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I hope so, Em. I hope so. I hope I'm gonna be in everything you ever do. <laughs> well, I'm guessing that um, for the people there who have seen the film, which I think should be most of the people you might have felt the same way watching it that I felt at Sundance, which is I went to the theater kind of expecting a film that I thought maybe might skew towards like the rape revenge films from the seventies, but you guys created something really different. I was, I kind of wanted to ask like, what did you want to say with this film that you felt like those type of films left unsaid? Um, well, I don't know. I think it's, 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 kind of probably a bit more subconscious than, than an active choice, but certainly I love the revenge thriller genre. Um, I think it's immensely cathartic and the more bloodthirsty, the better. But yeah, I just think, I, I, I suppose I'd not seen um, a real woman maybe at the center of that story. Um, I think women very rarely resort to violence, which is, you know, I think that the reasons for that are made quite plain in this movie. Um, and so I, you know, you, I was just thinking about, well, could you have a revenge movie that had all the deliciousness and the same story beats and the same tropes, but kind of twisted in a different way and, you know, made to feel closer to, I suppose, you know, the real grief and the real trauma and, you know, what a real woman like might do. I mean, I always start with what would I do? And I couldn't, I couldn't really shoot anyone. I don't think, I mean, I could probably, but I'd have no idea how to turn the gun on. If that's even a thing you do with a gun. There you go, already I'm dead. Um, so I certainly couldn't do that, but I could, yeah, I could just ruin someone's life. So that's kind of the starting point, I think, for this film maybe. Yeah, I mean, for both of you, kind of what I kept thinking is this film to me really highlighted the difference between revenge and restitution, you know, that that you can do things, but can you ever be made whole or felt complete? I mean, where do you think that line is? Yeah. Definitely, I think that's the thing that this, I mean, it's sort of um, the unsexiest pitch in the world for this movie is it's a revenge movie about why revenge is miserable and futile. I mean, that's, I think that's kind of what it is. And you're absolutely right. Like it is, there's a reason it's quite an uncommon, um, vengeance is quite an uncommon thing because it's harrowing and it, and it afflicts the person doing it just as much as the person they're doing it to. And so, really Carrie and I, all of our discussions right from the beginning were about, you know, we were, we were talking much more about addiction and self-harm and grief than we were about revenge. I think that's, mm -hmm. it so happens that that's the kind of salve that this movie and her journey takes, but really this could have been a movie where she was addicted to sex, I suppose, or addicted to alcohol or drugs, but it's just, it's that the thing she's addicted to is trying to make things right. 
mean, tell me more about that, Carrie. What were you thinking with putting in ideas like addiction into this character? Well, like Emerald said, it wasn't ever in, in it's, we talk about the film so much now and, and, you know, the descriptions always sort of contain revenge in them. And, and certainly, you know, it, it was, um, it's, it's a lot of sort of how the film has been received, but in actually making it, it's so funny talking about a film, you know, a year and a half after you made it, because mm. when we were actually making the film, kind of going into it, you know, I think we had such, a, what was so wonderful about it is that it was a 23 day shoot. There was, you know, Emerald had three weeks of prep time. It was, it was something that came together very quickly and we did, and our, our conversations were so much more about, um, about Cassie's, specific personal journey and I think it struck me that she was somebody who felt that she was acting out of extreme loyalty and love and she's grieving um and this event that happened 10 years before feels as real to her as if it happened yesterday or as present and that her you know her attempts at sort of correcting things or, or writing injustice and sort of schooling these men um is really just a you know it's 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 something that in the moment makes her feel better you know it's in very much like addictive behavior for the, for that brief moment there's a release of her pain and the pain sort of gets alleviated momentarily and then sure enough you know starts to rebuild and rebuild until the urge takes over again to sort of feel that release and i think that's very much how she's you know coping in the first instance when you meet her in the film and then I think as the film goes on and these sort of ghosts from her past are kind of thrown back in I think that you something starts to sort of um unravel it doesn't feel good anymore um mm. it doesn't feel good to hear that she was right it doesn't feel good to be denied neither nothing's working you know um and so you know, as the film goes on and the more people she meets, it doesn't seem like anything works. It doesn't feel good to have proved the Dean wrong and sort of, you know, traumatized her by pretending to have kidnapped her daughter. It doesn't feel good to smash up the car. You know, these things have moments of relief in them, but it, there's nothing really sort of, um, sort of works anymore. Um, and so she has no choice but to just keep going. I mean, that makes it sound a little bit like I don't know, a combination of like picking at a scab or scratching a mosquito bite, but like in eternity and for hell. We really did talk about yeah. that a lot. We said this is the thing is, is that there's a there's a reason that she's never looked up Al Monroe's name on Facebook. It's not hard to find him. It's that she's she knows that that's the line. And she's been, as you say, she's been picking at that scab and it sort of feels pleasurable for a bit. And then it just, but that's yeah that's been the thing she's been doing she's been she's been going out and doing her thing just to give herself the illusion of control because I think that the moment that she looks at the real stuff that's all gonna that's all gonna go but she's definitely that's the thing about it's also the thing about Nina dying such a you know long time ago and it all it all being so far away is the whole the, the grief has sort of calcified it's it's now she's sort of, maybe it's not an open wound, it's sort of scar tissue and she's just, she's toughened so much. Um, but really, I think like it is a revenge movie, I, of course, but it's, but for me always, it was a film about forgiveness and how we get it and who asks for it and how we ask for it and how we give it, how we give it to ourselves, I guess. How, how do we get it? How do, how do you think we get it in a situation like this? Well, it's difficult. Again, as Kerry says, you know, it's, you make something because you want to explore it and it's, it's difficult afterwards to then, you know, so much of, I think, what I feel is in the film, but, but I think certainly in the film, the way you get forgiveness is quite explicitly by acknowledging wrongdoing um, and asking for forgiveness and apologizing. It's the same, it's the same journey as any sort of religious journey, really. You get forgiveness if you confess and if you atone. But the trouble is, is that what Cassie's been experiencing, it's not just the trauma of the thing that happened. 
but I think it's the, the feeling that so many people feel, which is that, yes, the thing that happened is a horrible trauma, but then everyone's saying it was fine and shut up about it, get over it. It was years ago, we were kids, it happened. You know, that's the thing that has, that drives you mad. That's, mm -hmm. that's the horror of this stuff, I think. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that you two created that right away, I think sets a different tone for this movie and like kind of shows the direction that you want to take it in is just the look of the character itself that you guys created. I mean, on behalf of all people who are sick of strong women being depicted in film as wearing like black leather and spike heels, um, this is really nice to see. I mean, I'd love to hear about that. Like you guys putting together what you wanted Cassie to be. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's both, isn't there? There's also sort mm -hmm. of um, woman who's suffering or, you know, woman who's having dark experience wearing sort of sad clothes and, mm -hmm. you know, not having a shower and sort of staring out the window crying, which actually Emerald was very clear from the first meeting. She said, I'm not making a film about a woman in a gray cardigan. This is not, sort of, <laughs> you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yay, great. <laughs> um, but, you know, not to say that, you know, serious, you know, quote unquote, gritty dramas aren't, don't have their own value. Of course they do. But I think I just was so drawn to this, you know, um, looking at it in a different way and actually looking at the ways in which we do use our, you know, we do use all of these tools in our arsenal, you know, in, as women uh, every day. Um, and um, and I, I think, you know, what Cassie is doing is so clever in that, you know, she's very aware of how she can use, you know, the way that she looks, her, her, you know, her perfect manicure, her hair, the clothes that she wears, these sort of lovely, pretty, floral printed t-shirts to sort of essentially say to the world, nothing to see here, you know, nothing to look at really. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a girl in a coffee shop. Everything's fine. You don't need to ask me any questions. You don't need to come near to me. You know, there's a real, she's really hiding in plain sight and She's also very unthreatening, you know. Um, and of course, in the evening, sort of escapades. I've never, I haven't found the right word for what that is. <laughs> escapades. <Not definitely>. Escapades. <laughs> ventures a lot, and like venture sounds weird too. Escapades is definitely wrong, but I know, you know, you know what I mean. Um, you know, sort of her, her. You know, it's it's important that she doesn't ever look the same. That she looks because they could be the same people coming in and out of these. There's a finite amount of clubs. She's not traveling across state lines to do this, you know, so she's got to look totally unrecognizable. Um, and she can do that very effectively. She knows how to do that. And a lot of it, you know, it was a lot of fun to sort of work with Emerald and with Nancy and um, figure out those different characters that she's, you know, playing. I mean, I have to admit, and maybe this is completely coincidental, but in the shot, where you're in a nurse's costume, you have a colorful wig on, I'm watching you walk from behind with so much purpose. I had this shiver. I was like, oh, this is this is my female Joker movie. <laughs> well, I think we shot it before Joker came out. Um, and so, and it's funny, it's been something that people have sort of re remarked upon. And I think probably the nurse's uniform isn't something that the sort of, um, Heath Ledger mm. performance. I, it's something I'd not thought of, but um, but yeah, no, it was a sort of funny, funny coincidence, maybe that mirror, that mirror moment. Um, oh yeah, of course, because I didn't actually didn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's only really <laughs> since this has come out that people have mentioned it. But actually, mm. yeah, I really hope that um, I think Cassie's more righteous than Joker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm concerned of people like. She's a villain, she's an ultimate villain. But really that out was a kind of, you know, it was a subversion, I think, of all of the the, uh, the sort of, I don't know, iconic revenge thriller, get sexy, get mad, mm -hmm. get a machete. You know, that, that was the kind of, you know, you can't have a revenge movie without that moment. It's just, again, like what happens in that moment. Yeah. I mean, so many of my favorite scenes in this film, one of the ones that pops out, some of my favorite moments of like Carrie's performance that you guys put together are actually just silent. Like one of the ones I'd love to just hear you talk about is the moment where you're walking 
there's construction workers yelling at you. And it's like, you figure out what the most unnerving response could possibly be. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, do you want to talk, I mean, you wrote that. Well, uh, I mean, I think again, it's just like, well, firstly, everything really in this film is down to Carrie being so brilliant and just, yeah, being a genius. But, you know, with that scene, I think it was so much fun because it's kind of a distillation of everything in this movie is that you're not, she's not doing anything except making people examine their own behavior. So the most powerful thing that you could do if people are yelling like, hey baby, you know, walk of shame, like nice ass, whatever it is that they're all yelling. You know, if somebody does that to you and you just stop and look at them calmly, like that's horrifying <laughs> because suddenly that like drive-by element that was like, woohoo, is like, oh no, oh, now we just, what do we do? We just go home or, and of course, I think that thing that lots of us have felt before, which is the moment where um, the men go from like bawdy fun to feeling guilty or embarrassed. And then that embarrassment immediately turns to like aggression. So the kind of little journey that they go on just as she stares at them is like, hey, sexy, then we'll fuck you. Oh, well, what are you doing? Like, fuck you. And then actually, no, she could be crazy. Let's go. It was, it's, you know, and it's just, I don't know. It just felt like, it felt like the, the perfect Cassie thing, really, as she's eating a, <laughs> eating a hot dog. Because there's nothing better than a very on the nose phallic metaphor. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about um, your scenes with Bo because like, I mean, first I just have to ask a dumb question. Like how many takes did y'all do of the spitting in the coffee scene? Quite a lot, quite a lot of takes. <laughs> really? Yeah, and it was the first thing we shot uh, together. What? It was the first thing Bo and I shot together. Um, we'd already shot a day. We did the first day was with Alice and Brie in the restaurant, but then the next day was was in the coffee shop. It was Bo, it was our first scene. Yeah, he drank the spit like, he actually drank it like about four times. For when real. he actually drinks it for real? Yeah. That, I mean, that's brave. I don't he's, think he's getting enough credit well, for that. <laughs> I don't, was, I mean, did he have to? I can't remember the shot. I can't remember if it's a two. He, didn't in the, he did shot. in the beginning, but I think he got a, a taste for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> to be honest, it was actually, we don't use the, the kind of two shot in, in the film, but mostly he was drinking it when he had to, you know, in the scene. It's not like he was like, spit in here even more, but. No, but there was one take where he did it when the camera was on me and I spat in it and he actually drank it off camera because there was an outtake, which was on a blooper reel that I don't know where it is, but um, I can't get through the scene because I've just watched him drink my own spit for real for like the fifth time. <laughs> I think it was quite a lot because it was when we were on you and he sort of goes, oh, oh God. Yeah, it was a big one. A big oh, one. that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. That makes me a little reminiscent for the pre-COVID era. That's just, <laughs> that's so touching. Very pre-COVID. Yeah. <laughs> but your arc with him, I want to ask you about that because, you know, you're this character who you know, doesn't like to let anybody in and finally gradually does let somebody in, lets her guard down. And then she, it, it seems like for the first time in a decade and then she winds up, you have to wind up having to let your character get hurt, you know? And that for you, that arc to play, that seems, I mean, fun, but also a little bit painful. Yeah, I mean, there's something kind of almost in the, in the playing of it, I think there's something sort of, there's something so, I mean, the spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Spoiler. Yes, we are going to be spoiling things. So if you have not seen it, we're about to enter spoiler territory, just as a warning. Okay, proceed. Thank you. <laughs> you did wave your arms or you said you I did. I, I'm a traffic cop. Yeah. <laughs> spoiler. Um, yeah, I mean, in a way, in the playing of it, I, I it was such a brilliant moment, you know, when she finally sort of sees the tape. Um, that's kind of act of fun, you know, um, so yeah, super painful for the character, quite fun for me. Um, you know, cause it's a sort of, it, 
yeah, I, when I read the script, I was god, gobsmacked by that moment. I didn't see it coming, and um, and she doesn't. And it's so, it's so, it's like a, it's like a stab wound. Um, so it's you know, and that's kind of fun stuff to play. Um, but I think it's interesting with the with Bo because, you know, there's so much I think of of my character because Emerald and I didn't make a bunch of decisions before we went in. We we had a very clear. Nina was, um, you know, we had all of that figured out, but we didn't have a bunch of performance decisions made at all. It was very free and easy. And Emerald just had such a clear idea of what she wanted. Um, and so when Bo came in, it really did, it just, it kind of created that side, you know, it really, he was just so funny and, you know, disarming and hilarious. And, you know, it sort of made that whole side of it so much fun, so easy. And also I think the thing is about both of them together is that um, you completely understand why Cassie's, you completely understand why it, it's impossible because they do fall in love. You can see it and it's, and it's you know, um, it was really important, I think, that for all of us, we saw like glimpses of the, of the promising young woman who was mm -hmm. the, you know, the person before all of this stuff happened. And that actually we kind of get a sense of what life could be like if she did let go, if she did just put it in the past and forget it. And, you know, and Ryan, the, the character of Ryan is so important. We needed to believe almost more than any other thing in this movie, we needed to believe that he was the one and that he was the one for all of us, that all of us watching it were like, this is, you know, this is true love. So um, it was such a hard, it's such a hard part to cast because yeah, Cassie's just, she's just the hardest nut to crack. And then he drinks her spit and we're all like, okay, well just <laughs> give up the thing, run away to the bathroom. <laughs> well, he drinks her spit and he knows all of the words to Paris Hilton's stars are blind. And I mean, was that always the song? Yeah. It was. Yeah. Well, because it's like, it's because it, because it's the song that would, it says so much about someone that they are happy to like, they, they know all the words, they're, mm -hmm. they're proud of it and they're delighted to shout that out in public. And I think like so many of us have had, you know, the conversation about the deep cut, mm -hmm. um, Leonard Cohen deep cuts and things with men. And we're like, yeah, yeah sure, Leonard Cohen, really good, thank you. But I'd much rather somebody slap drop to Paris Hilton. Actually, I didn't even think about this, but now I can actually tell you guys face to face that after, since I saw the movie at Sundance last year, when I got my Spotify report of my number one song listened to, it actually was Paris Hilton's Stars Are Blind because of you guys. So such a good song. <laughs> it really That's is. A good song, honestly. He's amazing as well. You know, like I think so much of this film really is about and, and the soundtrack is is kind of using pop music that is so often like used ironically mm. or sort of, yeah, it's kind of, well, like multicolored manicures and ha wearing kind of beautiful sort of girly clothes. It's sort of synonymous with being like frivolous and silly, yeah. but it's just not, I have no, it's just completely mad that, I don't know who decided that. And, and you know, someone like Paris, not only is it an amazing song, but you know, she herself, I think is a perfect example of somebody who was who was part, you know, this this culture, the things that we're talking about in this movie happened to her, you know? And it's so, I don't know, I think it's, yeah, we, we all need to re-examine our behavior those, those years, really. I am so glad you actually brought that up because that was a tangent that was on my mind between like the Paris on the soundtrack, the Britney on the soundtrack. I mean, it. I've only. I feel like it's only now coming into focus for me what an awful time the early two thousands was to be a young woman, and having them on the soundtrack reminded me. I feel like I'm still processing everything we just adjusted to that was terrible. Yeah. 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 But so, I actually heard that um, an earlier draft of the script, the film ended not with the scene we have now, um, but with with the bonfire, with Carrie's body being burned. I mean, I mean, is, is that true? Well, it's so difficult because yes and no, it was, it was an option, but I think it was one that was, well, 
for many reasons, it was very quickly, uh, it was very quickly changed, not changed, but kind of finessed because I think firstly, it was just, it was so sad that it felt, it was, I think it was, you know, I don't know, it just didn't feel right. But the main reason it didn't feel right to me was that I didn't believe that Cassie, she certainly doesn't sacrifice herself. Mm. Um, but she, there's no way looking at how meticulous she is and how experienced she is, that she wouldn't have a sense going to that cabin with a weapon the first time she's ever, ever gone anywhere with a weapon, that she's putting herself in immensely grave danger because she's, mm. she's, she knows, like we all know. I mean, I would never try and, I would never turn a knife on a man because it would be turned immediately back on me. So it, I think that it was important to, to sort of say, yes, there are horrible truths about this stuff, but there was no way someone like Cassie wouldn't have considered that, decided it was worth the risk or, you know, been unable to resist the risk and made a contingency plan. And her contingency plan is, you know, it's set up for a few days later. So it's kind of designed that she could intervene, you know. And there are a couple of, you know, people sort of say, somebody said um, she gets rid of her plates. She gets rid of her plates in case she succeeds. You know, this is the thing about everything she does. Because if she succeeds, she doesn't want to get caught either. So every, you know, she's, um, I, but I think that the, that ending, you know, I, I don't think it would have been true to the character, but I, it certainly would have been true to the context of the world we live in, but it wouldn't have been true to her. Yeah. What do you make of the final thing we see, which is that em emoticon wink? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was sort of, I've been like, my boyfriend and I, when we finished the movie, like when he watched it for the first time, we had like a 15 minute conversation trying to debating what the emoticon might might mean. Like <laughs> I mean, it's so difficult. What I when I when the film came out and a friend of mine said, You are gonna have to, you're gonna talk, you're gonna have to talk about all of this stuff a lot, a lot, a lot. What are you gonna do? And I was like, I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm just gonna let it speak for itself. And here I am, like, let me just sit down and <laughs> every tiny detail. <laughs> so I think the truth of it is, is like, there are some things that I think it is just better to remain ambiguous. Okay. You know, That's fair. definitely those, the last sequence is one of them. Yeah. Well then we're about to kick it to audience questions, but before I do kind of on that note of like, arguing with a movie, dealing with a movie, I mean, in the pre-COVID times, you guys both did have a chance to see this movie with an audience. You know, like Emerald, I know you saw it at its first test screening. Carrie, I know that you saw it at Sundance. I mean, I, I've heard stories of what happened. I'm just kind of curious, like, I'd love to hear the story about like seeing this at a test screening and hearing two audience members get into a shouting match. Yeah, well, it was, it was our only test screening. It was the first and only test screening. Um, and it was in Burbank and it was a really big theater. And it was the, because it was the first one, they just got as kind of wide a range of people as possible to just get a sense of it. You know, that I think that's how test screenings go. They just mm -hmm. want to get a sense of what people think. Yes, and during the scene, you know, the, the, the scene with Al and Cassie on the bed, I was sitting right at the back, so I couldn't actually hear what was happening, but two audience members started shouting from across the, theatre at each other from the kind of middle of the theatre where I guess the aisle is in the middle mm -hmm. and and they shouted just the whole way through this scene and then one of them left and I didn't know what had happened but then the producers who were sitting closer said um that some that one of the people had really didn't like the scene and was very angry and the other person felt that if they didn't like the scene, then they could leave or they didn't have to shout because other people were watching and they mm. might be responding to it in a different way. And, you know, I think in hindsight now, it's, you know, it's kind of wonderful that anything now these days could provoke people to shout at each other. But at the time I was just like, I just thought, well, the producers are never gonna release this film now. Oh. I'm glad they did. 
I'm glad they did it. Now we have audience questions coming at you. Um, here's the first one. Um, first, a bunch of compliments. Great movie. One of the most talked about movies of the year, definitely. Uh, and the question is, I was curious about why you decided to set the movie in America. Was there something about American men in particular that fits this story better than men in Britain? Uh, no, I would say truly um, it is worldwide phenomenon. Um, it was actually just practically speaking um, Lucky Chap, the production company who bought it. They bought it before I wrote it and um, they asked that it be set in America. Gotcha. And that's um, Margot Robbie's company, right? Or, yeah, yeah. Um, another question is, let's see, can you talk about the scene where Cassie views the video? Because there's two obvious emotional beats in the scene. like. Cassie finally seeing what was done to Nina and the reveal that Ryan was part of it. Um, so as an actor, okay, did you try to play out an emotional reaction to both throughout the course of seeing these two charts of like seeing what's happening and seeing Ryan in it? Or did you pick one emotion over the other and focus on that as your overriding emotional response? No, yeah, so, so Emerald um, had, um, I think it was Max Greenfield because we didn't have um, Chris at that point for Al. Um, so Max and Bo did a sort of audio recording uh, uh, where Max, you could hear Max kind of um, in the background sort of making sort of general sort of bro noise. And then at a certain point, you just heard Ryan say, hey man, like turn the camera away. Um, so I had that kind of audio cue to see Ryan in the room. Um, so obviously there's no, um, obviously no video. <laughs> Um, so I, yeah, it was sort of, uh, the thing that struck me about it was that she just didn't want, you know, there's no part of her, she, 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 it's almost something she can't look at, you know, it's, it's so horrific. It's like watching, a, you know, it is the worst thing in the world. You just don't want to have, you don't want to make eye contact with it, but, um, you know, she's forcing herself to, um, and, and then of course, when Ryan comes into the picture, I think it's just like the world falls away, white noise can't, feels all the blood rushing to your head. So the, the, definitely having the audio um, track to re respond to is sort of helpful because there, there are two totally different things going on. One is this, mm -hmm. I know what I'm gonna see. I know what I'm gonna see. It's gonna be fucking horrible, but I know I have to watch it. I know what I'm gonna see. And then suddenly it's like the, the room has just collapsed and everything is, you know, so it's, um, so it was, um, yeah. And we did about four takes of it. Um, Wow, that sounds like a really hard day. Um, another question is, um, what do the journals and the, what do the colors in the journal correspond to? And at some point, did you think about decoding that for the audience, all the different pen colors that you guys have? No, yeah, I mean, yes, I think uh, I, well, it's just, that's something that I don't talk about. I think it's kind of, <laughs> okay. It's another one of our ambiguous. <laughs> I think if it, if it needed decoding, it would have been in the movie, but it's better. Okay, that is fair. <laughs> what about this one? I'll throw this guy's one at you. Um, I absolutely loved your use of something wonderful from The King and I. Uh, what was your inspiration for using that piece at such a critical moment in the film? Well, um, it was one of the, I think that there are a few songs that were in the script um, and that was one of them, just because I think, firstly, I think it's the most beautiful song, one of the most beautiful, songs ever written and it is one of the most romantic songs ever written but it's also a song about a man who is incredibly cruel um and but it's okay because occasionally he does something wonderful and I think that's the thing about this film you know it's like let's hang on to that something wonderful and ignore everything else and so it just felt yeah it just it always felt um, right and like so many kind of musical choices in this film really so it was so much about and the emotion is always the first thing what it makes you feel but also if there is a kind of lyrical element that could be sly or funny or you know any of these things it's it's helpful I think it's raining men is the perfect example like the moment you imagine it physically actually raining men and the bloodbath that <laughs> would actually be is suddenly kind of different to experience 
I mean, this is a question that I think is actually kind of tangential to what you're talking about, which is, um, so I'm just curious to know, like, if Carrie, if you listened to a playlist that Emerald gave you on set to get into character, or if there was, like, music, maybe a movie or a book that helped you bring Cassie to life? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I listened, um, not on set so much, but, uh, you know, definitely in the run-up and around shooting the film, I listened to Emerald's playlist, which was, you know, had Boys, Charlie XCX, had Paris Hilton, Toxic, something wonderful. So all of these songs were sort of floating in my head and the Wagner that's playing in the car when she sort of gets out and smashes up the car. And in fact, Emerald played that on the day on her phone in the car and just left it off camera. Um, so I was listening to that before we shot that scene. Um, but it was like a lot of the time when I'm doing films, I do have sort of headphones in a lot and um, before certain things, but the majority of this, I didn't. I just wanted to be chatting all the time to everyone having a nice time because it was such a lovely, but there were, you know, there's a few moments, but there was weirdly a Vampire Weekend song called Big Blue that became a kind of theme for um, Nina in my head. So I used to play that, you know, I played that a bit before, you know, watching the tape and the scene with Alfred and scene with Molly. Um, but the rest of the time it was just, you know, such a fun set. And there also wasn't a huge amount of time to be sort of standing around listening to music because we had to shoot quite quickly. <laughs> so I couldn't have that, you know, we were on, a, on the go. Well, this song actually kind of builds on that too. Um, somebody's asking, what was your process in developing such a deep care connection to Nina, this character that we never actually see? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely having a song that I connected to her was really helpful. Um, but it was really all of the conversations that Emerald and I had, you know, we, we kind of sort of figured her out together. Um, and that sort of sisterhood, um, that they had and that was very familiar to both of us we both had that person in our lives who was our best best friend as a teenage girl and um so kind of that feeling of, of loving all the same things and sort of you know um the pact that you make um yeah at that age and how how much it matters and how much it really does feel like it's the two of you against the world you know at a certain point um so it was really, yeah, Emerald and I had a very clear idea of who Nina was in our mind. And so it was sort of, and no one else did, which was nice in a way, because no one knew her apart from, you know, Cassie. And so in, in our minds, no one knew her apart from Emerald and I. So it was sort of, we, we were so sort of in sync on that. Yeah. Well, well, Nina's her soulmate, really. That's kind of what we talked about a lot as well. I think it's a little more intense. Like, you know, what happens when you lose your soulmate? You're kind of lost after that. And it's such, I do just think it, it's such a particular thing, that friendship and that love that you have. And it, it's very rarely examined, I think, in movies or in general, maybe. Okay, there's something about your best friend in that window between like teenage to college, where it's mm -hmm. one of the deeper relationships I think you ever have in your entire life. Um, on a different topic, um, here's a question. I was intrigued by the short reference to Night of the Hunter. What made you choose that film to reference? I think, well, I mean, partly because it's my favorite film, um, but, but practically uh, the, the reference, the, the kind of clip that we use, we needed something for her parents to be watching and it felt like they'd be, you know, cause they're day TV watchers. It felt like it would be one of those like TCM old movies. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, one of like many brilliant speeches, but, but the, but the speech that we used is a bit that there are things you do hate Lord perfume smelling things, lacy things, things with curly hair. And it's just that perfect, I think, distillation of the combination of disgust and desire that so much of this film kind of talks on, the sort of the way that women's desirability makes people angry and full of sort of loathing and self-loathing and all that stuff. But, and then also, and then later we use Lullaby, the song, when just after the tape um, from the movie. And yes, it, it just, I think, I love how real Night of the Hunter feels, but also how allegorical it is. And I think it, that's something that I hope is also a little bit true of Promising a Woman. So, that, so it sort of felt like it shared a kind of fairy tale element. I think that's true. Um, somebody wants to know your favorite costume. And if you both have a different costume, that's wonderful too. I'm running through them in my head. <laughs> I mean, 
nurses cost I don't know it's it's weird like yeah I mean it's it's kind of a I can't really be at all objective about it I'm sure you probably can't either you created them <laughs> with Nancy I mean I don't know I think I love all of I love all of them but mostly again because I'm not it's not me in the clothes I think if it was me wearing clothes I'd feel very different I think obvious so the baseball tee that Carrie wears I love that uh, second time she sees Bo which has um what looks like a little boy cuddling a Bambi under a rainbow but actually the boys shop Bambi and the Bambi is dying <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, and it's a t-shirt that my sister made. Uh, my sister's a designer and, and I just, you know, there was just something so lovely about having something of hers in the movie too. And, but it also, you know, just felt like it really ref reflected what and who Cassie is. Well, speaking of like reflecting people's personalities, um, a lot of the guys in the film, like Ed, Adam Brody, Christopher Mintz Plass, Max Greenfield, they're mostly known for playing really nice guys in their careers, but they're playing not so nice guys in this film. Like how intentional was that casting in terms of subverting audience expectations and, you know, affirming the theme of the story? Yeah, really important. I think it was, it was just important that every person in this movie was someone we trusted, someone we had crushes on. You know, so much of it is about, again, like Cassie, appearances being deceiving and, um, you know, and it, and it being about people you like, because it's really interesting, the thing of subverting the idea of the good guy, because actually the guys in this movie think they're good guys. They really do. Like they, in another movie, they would be the good guys because they're doing stuff that we see in mainstream comedies quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of, it's that actually discomforting thing of, you know, it's, it's never occurred to them they're not good um and I think that's what happens to all of us when this it's not complicated when it's villains or bastards it's really complicated when it's somebody you love somebody who'd, who'd never been weird with you somebody at work who's always been a really stand-up guy you know your brother your best friend it's that's when it's tough so it you know it had to be choosing those people that you love and that people wouldn't really believe you people whose side you know you'd take yeah we have time for one more right before i throw it back to chris to uh, wave us all off and um this is a great question i want to make sure we include like i'm a high school teacher and i shared the basic premise of this movie with my students to open up a discussion during distance learning uh, they're curious, like, what message would you want to come across to the young female high school students that are already experiencing some of the situations in this film? And also, what about the male students? God, that's a really hard question to answer because I think, I think the, the most important thing that people could ever take from anything is have an open conversation about it. Because anything I could say would not be useful, but what will be useful is communicating between themselves and, uh, you know, and as honestly as they feel comfortable doing. I think that's really, if this film's about anything, it's about covering things up and not talking about them and how bad that is. So, yeah, so I, I think that, that they, yeah, it, I would encourage them all to like really talk about it between themselves and the, and the boys just as much as the girls, like I think, I think it's just as important for young men to, well, you know, that we made this film as accessible as possible, I think, in order that it would be, you know, a movie that lots of people would want to watch and talk about afterwards. So, yeah, I mean, that's a very wishy-washy answer, but yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, Emerald and I talked to a journalist the other day who said that it was his new family, you know, fate, one of his new family favorite films and he had a daughter who was in her early twenties and, you know, he said they had a big conversation over dinner about it. And I think that's, you know, um, is quite right. It's, we're not, we, we you know, don't um, purport to be experts about anything um, or have any of the answers. But I think, you know, for these conversations to start, even within your home, you know, is, is really, you know, if you can talk about this stuff with your family, you're doing a hell of a lot better than I did. When, you know, it's, it, that's a different world, you know, really. Um, and that's, that, you know, that would be a really great result. 
Oh, Carrie, Emerald, we're about to bring Chris back out to wrap everything up, but I want to say thank you so much uh, for being here. We've all kind of waved goodbye and thank you again. Um, it's been, this has been a lovely conversation. Thank yes, you just so much. Thank you, Emerald, Carrie, and Amy for that deep dive into the film. That was fascinating. Was, we could just continue to listen. That was so great. So, but thank you so much for joining. And to our audience, uh, thank you for tuning in as well, as always. Um, please uh, join us starting Monday for our Amazon Studio Spotlight. That's going to run all the way through next Saturday. Uh, we'll see you then and have a great day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you.